Welcome to MMA True Fan, a biographical podcast series on legendary mixed martial artists. In this episode on George St. Pierre, hear exclusive interview clips with John Danaher, Kenny Florian, Pat Militich, Matt Serra, Jake Shields, George St. Pierre, and more. Join us on Patreon for exclusive bonuses. Please subscribe, rate, and review on Apple Podcasts, YouTube, or wherever you're listening. George used to jump in a, in a, in a, in a bus and come down to, to New York, train the whole day, and then go back in a bus again. You know, I believe it. If there was someone that I was happy when he became the champion, that was George St. Pierre. His success couldn't have happened to a better guy. I mean, George St. Pierre is the nicest human being. He's a great, great person. At the same time, he's an amazing athlete, great fighter. He's a good pioneer, man. He's a good role model. He was also one of the first really true superstars of mixed martial arts. He was the first guy who was like a household name. Unlike most of the superstars of mixed martial arts, he didn't have to go the bad boy route to do that. He came across as a guy who openly confessed the fears and doubts that he had about himself when he went into fight. He didn't have a persona. You know, I, I'm just a tough guy who feels no fear, feels no pain. But he was never that guy. He was always the man who came in and said, yeah, I'm literally terrified when I fight. My way of dealing with that is to prepare as in the most professional fashion in which I can. And he used his fears as a weapon to become a better martial artist and one of the most successful in history. MMA True Fan presents George St. Pierre. Khabib was very excited for me because for a fighter, a fighter doesn't think like a normal person. George St. Pierre does not think like a normal person. That was him talking about his desire to fight Khabib Nurmagomedov. A fighter always wanted to fight a guy who seems invincible, a guy who seems like the perfect fighter, who's unbeatable. He has an aura of invincibility. So that means if I do it, I'll be the first to ever done it. It's not a question of money. Yeah, the money is there, but it's not a question of money first. It's a question of, of glory, of, of self-accomplishment, of making it in a way that you'll be in the history forever, you know what I mean? For myself, you know? The UFC Hall of Famer and his team made several attempts to schedule the fight, but were ultimately turned away. <laughs> My agent like would try everything, every way, like, like okay, uh, 155, okay, uh, catch weight, okay, uh, in Russia, whatever you want, like, uh, they didn't want it. They really did not want it. They had other plan. George defeated virtually every top welterweight fighter of his era. He also went up to win the middleweight championship against Michael Bisping in what was possibly his final fight. I've said this for a long time. This is UFC veteran Kenny Florian, who trained with George during his time at TriStar Gym in Montreal. Even when Anderson Silva was kind of touted as the GOAT, I, I always had George St. Pierre at the top of the list. Not, not only because of his consistency, but also the quality of competition that he faced at the time. and. You know, for me, that kind of consistency and also that kind of well-rounded martial arts skill is what stands out to me. Kenny continues with some of the attributes that helped make George what he became. With George St. Pierre, you never knew what was coming. He could jab you to win. He could do that Superman punch whenever he wanted. He could kick with the best of them. Um, he could submit you. He could wrestle his way to a win. There were a variety of ways and a variety of skill sets that George St. Pierre could employ. And I think his ability to systemize both his jab, his Superman punch, his leg kick, and his double leg takedown. He, he, he did it in such a way that you, they all look the same. UFC Hall of Famer Pat Militich used to train one of George's main rivals, former UFC champ Matt Hughes. He talked about George's ability to dominate opponents using a tactic he's instilled in his fighters over the years. I think he really paid attention to the concepts that I always try to paint for people in terms of striking. He, he did it to a T. He established his jab very well, and then he used feints and fakes with his jab. And that's all, that's all you really have to do to control an entire fight. Once you can establish that you have a jackhammer and fast jab and they, and they fear it, then you can just use feints and fakes and no, they, they, they don't know what the hell's coming next, right? And so once you get that chink in the armor, the striking game is, is easy. So his understanding of 
never letting somebody know what's coming at them as far as being on your feet um, was just something that he, he did very, very well. Crazy Bob Cook trained two of George's opponents in Josh Koscheck and John Fitch. He shared a unique ability George used to control his opponents and the fights themselves. His skill that he maybe applied better than most anybody else was blending what he did together very seamlessly. So by the time you realized that he'd changed up what he was doing, it was already too late, you know. He'd, he'd, he'd go from standing to into his wrestling and those transitions very seamlessly and very smooth and very well-timed. Bob said something at the end that we often hear as being one of George's greatest strengths, and that's his timing. Timing? Timing. Timing. What exactly do they mean when they talk about timing? John Danaher is one of George's primary trainers. When they talk about timing, what they're talking about is the time gap between striking, their opponent's reaction to the striking, and George's entry into a takedown. That specifically is what they're talking about. In terms of punching timing, you know, George was a good puncher, but what he was truly extraordinary at is the interface between striking and takedowns, and that's what really was his greatest weapon in, in the sport of mixed martial arts. So where did this unique sense of timing come from? Kenny Florian talked about how George's work ethic may have played a part. I think it's pretty simple. You know, I, I train an incredible amount. I could not sustain, and I've never seen anybody been able to sustain the volume of training that George St. Pierre uh, was able to do. Not, not, you know, you could do it for a few days and you could do it for maybe a week, but I can't tell you how many people have tried to do that and have actually left or failed in that process and trying to keep up with George St. Pierre. And that's not something that George does, you know, for a week and then stops. He's doing that week in and week out. Now, I, I think that there is certainly a lot of overtraining that George St. Pierre did. You know, I'm not saying it was a perfect process, but I've never seen anybody train more than, than George St. Pierre. A longtime training partner of George's, Carl Massaro, a third degree Henzo Gracie black belt, shared some of the discipline George showed during training. His regimen, like what he's got to do that day, he does. And you're not stopping him, you're, you, you know, we know better. You know, he's very polite, but he's got to do something, he's got to do it. And he's got, if there's ever like a person around him, like us as training partners, we knew, let George do his thing. We're there to add to his training, not take away from it. We're not going to be like, oh, let's go here instead. Even that being said, if someone tries to do that to him, he's very polite at shutting it down. He'd be like, oh, no, no, I really got to go here. But he's regimented. Like in the morning, you know, he, he doesn't wake up until about 11, uh, 11 a.m. or so because his theory is, and he goes to bed late. He says, listen, I'm a headliner fight. He goes, I usually don't fight until about midnight. He says, there's no reason for me to wake up at six in the morning. Because a lot of people are like, oh, you got to wake up at six and do your road work. He goes, no, that's ridiculous. He goes, uh, this is my lifestyle. He goes, if I'm going to, I have to teach my body to be at its peak right around like midnight and perform. And so he'd wake up at 11, you know, we'd always get breakfast, he, he'd have his schedule, he'd have his routine, he'd sprint once a week, you know, or maybe he'd go to gymnastics, or maybe he'd get a massage later that day, and then it was always like wrestling, jiu-jitsu, boxing, but he never missed a workout. Like, that's just what he does, like a machine. Carl also commented on how George had a unique ability to remain positive during training, even when things weren't going his way. I've almost always, whenever the plans fell through with us, like we couldn't meet at this time or whatever happened or this club was closed or this restaurant, it's, oh, no, no, it's better. Let's just do this. Better. This is better. And I always thought, like, because I'm not like that. And I was like, wow, this is, this is a lesson I could take from George. Like he just finds the positive in it. And uh, I think that, you know, with all the adversity he's come through and, and to reach a level he's reached, yeah, I, I think that that's definitely an asset. In addition to having a good attitude, he was able to move past minor day-to-day -day issues that sometimes get in the way. TriStar Gym striking coach Sandro Fur has worked with George since the late 90s. He talked about George's success in working with his trainers, including one of his primary coaches, Faraz Sahabi. She Raz and, and him actually have been through thick and thin. It's all about wanting to learn and it's always about having a clean slate each and every day that you walk in through those doors at the gym. 
you know, like, if ever, like, you walk into the gym and every single day, like, is a new day. So it, there's always a clean slate. And I guess George had that knack, like, to always be a clean slate and learn every single time that he walked into the gym. Like, if he could have taken a bit of knowledge off of uh, Conrad Plow, which was a founder of TriStar, if he took a bit of knowledge off of Crew Phil Nurse, if he took some knowledge off of John Danaher, if he took knowledge off of Firaz, you know, and if he, like, took a bit of tricks, off, like, off of some of the sparring partners on it that he threw down with, like, that was always something to actually better him, you know? So I guess that's what makes him different, you know? And, of course, like, the discipline is a big aspect. George had a philosophy of training that was different from what some other gyms were doing at the time. He focused on training at a lower intensity to achieve a higher volume of repetitions. Carl Massaro shares. Faraz is a genius in my opinion and, and, and very underrated. He's an amazing, very intelligent man. And it was great that he met John. Um, they both have the same philosophy. And, and I've heard John say this years ago too. Uh, it's all about efficiency. If you're going to train as hard as you can every day, you're going to break down eventually. As, as he says, if you're building skill, you need to work out at lower intensity so you can come back the next day and work on a skill set. If it's just strength or physique you're after, then yeah, you can, I guess you can do a bodybuilding routine or something like that. But people forget that the primary focus of MMA and Jiu Jitsu is building skill, acquiring skill. It's not necessarily working out. And George always believed when we, he, people talk about strength and conditioning, George would be like, well, that's a big waste of time, what a lot of people are doing. He has a different definition of it, but George would do gymnastics and he'd sprint once a week. But most of his cardio is done doing actually what he would do in the ring, or in the octagon, rather. He'd spar, he'd do feet to floor, what they call shoot box, he, he would work fence wrestling, he'd work wrestling, he'd work jujitsu. And he, the idea, and this is Danaher's idea, I believe, is he would become as efficient at, as possible at these movements. He would become as efficient as possible at fence wrestling, jiu-jitsu. The idea is to use less energy than the guy you're going against. Training at a lower intensity also allowed George to focus on the nuances and different techniques and drill them with a high level of precision. Attention to detail, like John will show, John Danaher will show a move or something that George hasn't seen before. George will grab me or someone else after class and he'll be like, hey, I just want to drill that move. And he has a work ethic and he wants to drill it until he gets it down. That's just how he is. He likes to drill, he likes to work on things, and it's just very systematic. I guess it goes with the whole regimen. Faraz has said in interviews that he doesn't usually want his guys to train so hard that they are sore the next day. It's easy to overdo it sometimes. But Carl talked about how George showed both great discipline and a strong awareness of his body. So I'd say George's training is 100%. He trains every day. He would train five or six days a week, and he would take Sunday off sometimes several times a day. And, and he would cut most of his workouts at 45 minutes. Like we do hard training, hard rolling for 45 minutes. And he'd be like, okay, that's enough. I would never, ever see George go past his red line. Like if somebody was like, hey, George, let's work out. Let's do another round. And it was the end of the round. He'd be like, nah, I think I cut it for today. Like he knew when to call it quits. Bob Cook shared how training nearly every day, even when not preparing for a fight, isn't really the norm for a lot of fighters. You know, a lot of guys you see... In professional fighting, you know, if there's no fight, you know, they're not in the gym on on a day to day basis because you know they love it. Um, and that's why I think you know George just has a little different mentality. While George often trained at a lower intensity in order to build skill, there were times when he would turn it up a notch with his teammates, as Sandro shares. George was very respectful, and at the same time, like if we turned it up a notch, well, he followed. You know, so that's like that mutual love and respect. You know, like we weren't there to try to take each other's heads off. Like we were actually trying to get him better. So if we were used like to push the pace, well then like he followed. The amount of training that George did certainly helped him develop great technique. But what about his timing? One of his past opponents and friend of his, MMA veteran Carl Parisian, talked about how training at volume also helped George develop muscle memory. He's done those shots many, many times. And after so many times you, you train, it becomes second nature. It, everything comes down to the field. 
You don't have to remember. You don't have to think. Somebody touches, beep, boom, that's it. You touch my left elbow, my right arm goes up. It's like, you know, let's be like a puppet. John Danaher shared how, while volume was important, it wasn't the only factor in his case. When you're trying to develop skills, it comes a certain point where if you just keep doing the same thing over and over again, it just becomes meaningless repetition that doesn't add any kind of additional skills. Um, volume is important when you're first developing a new skill. But uh, if you just keep doing the same thing for years, you're going to reach a, a plateau and you're never going to progress from there. So volume is never the long-term answer. It's always about continued progress and change. There's a million athletes out there who have similar skills to George, but under pressure, they couldn't integrate them as well as, as he did. He also shared how George was very good about working with specialists and then scrutinizing the techniques he'd integrate to improve his game. I do believe that uh, a large part of it has to do with George had did specialized training in the various types of martial arts that underlie mixed martial arts. So, for example, he had a specialist boxing coach throughout his career. He changed the boxing coaches over time, but he always had a specialist boxing coach. He usually had specialist Muay Thai coaches that changed over time, um, but there was always a Muay Thai specialist. He had specialist wrestling coaches. But at the end of the day, when a mixed martial artist walks into the, into the cage, it's much more about their ability to integrate the various martial arts that they've learned. And even early on in his career, George would always talk to me about how a certain aspect of jiu that he was learning was interesting, but not suited to his mixed martial arts. And he would immediately reject that. So I would teach him, say, 20 techniques. He might look at them and say, well, all 20 were interesting, but I can use seven of them for fighting. So always in his mind, even from the earliest days, uh, 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 long before he the UFC, there was a sense in which he was analyzing technique and asking, is this something I can use in a mixed martial arts fight? So would tend to suggest that uh, much of this uh, integration skill came from within him. He was taught by specialists in uh, their various domains, but what made him famous wasn't specialization, it was integration. So I'm going to have to say that that came mostly from George. Not only was George constantly probing and integrating new techniques, he also wanted to learn from everyone, as another longtime trainer of his, Greg Jackson, explains. He was a martial artist that really, really, really just respected everything. Like any time that somebody, you know, it's practice and he's working with really high level guys. If somebody ever got the better of him, it was like the best day of his life. Like he would go and ask him, let's say he got him an arm bar or something, whatever. It's sparring, you know, you get caught, you catch other people. And he would go to that person and say, hey, how did you do that? And he would love it. And the guy would show him how he did the ankle lock or whatever he did. And then he would just drill it over and over and over again. And the same things after his fights, the second he would walk out of the fights, he would say, Greg, why, what did I do wrong here? You know, Finas, what did you do? What, you know, Phil, what did you see here? He would always want to do his after action reports immediately out of the cage. Like, why didn't I finish that? I thought I had it. Uh, it, it was that, that fire for the martial, the technical martial arts side that I always thought, wow, that, that is the real difference. That's a, uh, that's a guy that loves to kind of get the pieces of what he did right and wrong and, and do a martial arts style and proving yourself. Um, and so that was hugely impressive to me. Bob Cook stated earlier that by the time you realized what he was doing, it was already too late. Whether he was snapping a jab or going for a takedown, he always seemed to step ahead of his opponents. A John Phil Nurse worked with George as his striking coach for many years and shared an exercise they used to do to improve his quickness. It was actually a drill that George didn't really care for. What we would do, like one of the drills I would use, or you know, he didn't like it, but he understood it. And I really put it down to a lot of it working, working for him. You know, but we'd work on drills, we'd work on reaction, we'd work on speed, we'd work on being alert, all that kind of thing. But what I would do when he came in town, I'd be like, okay, George, we're going to do some drills, work on some Superman punches from different angles, going backwards, going forwards, reacting to one thing or another. And then I'd move around with him a little bit, just very lightly, just, you know, loosening up. And then I'd say, right, okay, we're going to do five rounds of sparring. And I would always put him with the smallest, like some really fast guys that I had in the gym at the time, but who were very light. Now, George would fight at 170 at the time. Well, that's what he used to fight at. So he'd probably come in around 185, something like that. And I would always put him with guys who were like 135, 140. 
who I knew were very fast. You know, they were quick. And the first, you know, sometimes you're like, oh, coach, they're too small for me. I'm like, no, you're fine. You're going to spar with these guys. And my thing with that was, he's going to have to speed up to catch these guys because they're going to hit him and be gone. They're gonna, he's going to be too slow because of the size difference. Yes, he's going to have the power. As much as these being, they weren't necessarily just regular guys. These were competition guys that I had that I knew were fast and they were good in their own right and their own size. So for the first three rounds, he would be complaining to me sometimes, like, coach, they're too fast, I can't catch them. But then by round four and round five, I would match him then with someone his own size. And when I did that, because he'd been trying to speed up against these small guys, his speed and his like reaction was way faster because he started off trying to hit these smaller guys and trying to catch them. When I put him with the guys his own size, he, he was fine. And it was like, he was really fast. And like I said, I would always do that. And I knew it always used to frustrate him, but he started seeing the difference towards like when I, if we did five rounds and I'm like, okay, round four, round five, okay, go with this guy now, which was a guy in his weight class. He was way faster than that, where it was like, you could see it very, very obviously. And that was one of the things we, I did every time when we did sparring, I would always do that. He didn't always like it, but he did it. And yeah, I think it definitely helped to make it his speed and sharpness and awareness like it was. He was often lauded for being an excellent student by his coaches and teammates. Phil recalled the first time he met with George at his gym, the Watt in Manhattan. George made quite an impression on him right away. I was very taken back by how he picked things up. You know, things that I did, that I just do naturally. He was like, how, how do you do that? How do you do this? And I don't know. He, he was very refreshing. He was very excited. He was very teachable. You know, some people, they're hard to teach. But he was very, very teachable. And he was picking things up really fast. And that was the first hour. Phil talked about how later on they became so familiar with one another that he would even be able to forecast some of George's moves at times. You know, sometimes we would go down to New Mexico for training um, at, at Greg Jackson's. And I don't know which fight it was, but one of the fights he was fighting, we were down there in camp working on, you know, techniques and one thing or another. And the 24-7 was there. You know, the 24-7, the UFC guys doing the filming and one thing or another, they were there. And they were like, yeah, we're going to be filming George's training. And, but one of the cameramen was uh, filming George one thing or another. And George was doing sparring. And I remember the cameraman, like, he was stood at the side of me filming stuff. And he was asking me, so what am I looking for? What is George doing? And one thing or another. And I was like, okay. So I remember George was doing whatever. And I was, I was telling the cameraman like, what George was going to do next based on his movement and based on what we had worked on. And it was like, it was really just like poetry. I was like, okay, so now he's going to throw a suit. He was sparring. It wasn't choreographed. He was sparring. And I was telling the camera, like, right, so he's probably going to do a Superman punch any minute now. And he did it. I said, now he's probably going to go and take it down. And he did it. Now he's going to do a left kick and probably move to the right. And I was saying things like that. And it was all going into place so in the end the cameraman said to me like wow that is amazing i can't believe that he's so well i call it being in tune i can't believe you two are so in sync like that and in tune like that i said well you know joy is a very good learner and listener and right now even i i was taken back a little bit because i was saying it but that's what we call in fighting being in tune with your coach where you you know, you think your coach, in a way, you kind of think your coach knows everything. Your coach is the best coach. Your coach knows what to do. But when you when you got the, the, the connection is when you think alike. Now, your coach is outside the ring or outside the act enough. And you're inside. And you kind of want to say to your coach, what should I do? But you can't look around and say, what should I do? You just got to do it. So eventually, you start to think the same. You start, you know, that that's the, the goal. And for that particular, that time when he was there, it really was like, it was, it was so insane. Even I was like, I was proud about it. I was like, wow, that is so cool. Like he's right the way over, he's over there doing the sparring and I'm over here and I'm saying he's going to do this now and he's going to do that and he's going to do this and he's going to do that. Now he's probably going to look for this. And he was just doing it one after the other. And it made, like I said, the cameraman was shocked about it. He was like, whoa, that's amazing. That's really, really cool. 
Even though George would often be in tune with his coaches, he was far from being predictable. I've drilled George's shootboxing entries with him since the early 2000s. To this day, almost 20 years later, when George does this drill with me, I've seen it so many times, I lost count many, many years ago. I still, to this day, cannot read when he's going to transition from a punch to a takedown. How deceptive and how difficult it is to read what, what he's going to do when he's standing in front of you, bouncing at distance, and then either comes in for a blitzing jab attack or level changes down and touches his shoulder to your hip. Now, you would think in 20 years I would be able to read it. There would be some kind of subtle cue. I still can't to this day. It's, now, imagine a fighter who's never fought him before, standing in front of him, in front of 20,000 screaming fans, trying to figure out in a 15- or 25-minute match what's going on. You can't. I, I couldn't do it in 15 to 20 years. I mean, how are they going to do it in 15 to 20 minutes? John wasn't surprised that George was so proficient at shootboxing because, according to him, George was the originator of it. But um, the deeper point here is that it, everyone wants to talk about you know, who had this influence on George. But let's get something straight from the start. George is an innovator as well as a great student. Okay, He's a good learner, but he's an even better innovator. And that's something he's never gotten credit for uh, in, in the various exposés of the, the course of his career. And I'm hoping to set the record straight here that the single greatest skill that George St. Pierre had as a mixed martial arts athlete was the skill that he refers to as shoot boxing. Okay, the integration of striking and grappling, um, in particular striking and takedowns. That was the defining skill that he had from the beginning to the end of his career. And he was absolutely the developer of his uh, shoot boxing system. He's a guy who, uh, who began the program, who who innovated it and who perfected it. And he had many influences. There were people who helped him in with boxing. There were people who helped him with kickboxing. But at the end of the day, none of them were shoot boxers. They were specialists in another domain, boxing, kickboxing, Muay Thai, wrestling. But the integration of those skills was what made George different. Like he could take all the various skills he learned and integrate them into shoot boxing. That was his development. Something that also contributed to George's success was his physical strength. Pat Milovich talked about a conversation he had with Matt Hughes following Hughes' first fight with George. After Matt beat him the first time when we were walking back to the locker room, I said, he looks strong. How strong is he? And Matt goes, he's real strong. So uh, if Matt says somebody's strong, trust me, they're, they're strong. Carl Parisian attributed George's strength to his background in gymnastics. I was like, Jesus Christ, this guy is fucking strong. And I know that gymnasts, they're muscle everywhere. These fucking guys, they're muscle everywhere. And if you want to be the ultimate athlete, that's what you train, that's what you do. You are, uh, gym, you have the gymnast strength in the body. You're that athletic. And then what do you put behind that? Kickboxing, boxing, grappling, wrestling, whatever the fuck you want to put behind that. And that's it. You become a perfect machine. St. Pierre did that. George showed us all there is to see inside the octagon. But something you didn't see was him get in trouble outside the cage. Craig Jackson emphasized this as being one of his key qualities. I'll tell you in my opinion what I think made George. I mean, obviously he's a genius at fighting, right? He knew what to do, when to do. He always he was, had a very high fight IQ. He made the right choices at the right time, which is a huge deal. But I'll tell you what I really think is one of the main things that contributed to success was how he was outside of the cage. He always handled his life. He never had, we never had real drama. I mean, you know, here and there, little tiny things. But he always handled his life. Uh, he was a martial artist that liked to fight. He wasn't a fighter that did martial arts. Um, and, and I think that's a big, big difference. So he, outside of the cage, was a sweetheart. He never got in trouble. Um, you know, he liked to go out and relax with his friends, but he wasn't starting fights. George had a quality that most great champions possessed, and one that often gets overlooked, as he shares. The fighter that wins the fight is not the best fighter. It's the fighter that, that fights the best fight the night of the fight. So even if you're the best fighter, doesn't mean you will win the fight. The night of the fight, the fighter that fight the best will win the fight. The same thing in games, in football, hockey, baseball. It's not the best team that win the game. It's the team that play the best. The Toronto Raptors, they won the, the, the championship, not because they were the best team on paper. Like St Stephen Curry's team were much better. 
but they play better. That's why they won. Same thing in fighting. People think in fighting is different. It's no no different than fighting. If there is ten fight, maybe the result could be different every fight, you know. But the night of the fight, when the lights are on, are you gonna pull the trigger or not? That's when it matters. So to be champion, one quality of a champion, a champion can perform when it counts. And it's not everybody. It's not in the gym. Some guys are gym guys. They they good in the gym. They're tough. You know they 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 pull this in the gym. But when the lights are on. Are you going to be able to perform? That's the question. You know, it's not everybody that has this capability. This unique ability was probably harder for him than a lot of people because, as he stated in past interviews, he felt the natural fears that creep inside us during high-pressure situations. He has talked about his fear of fighting, his fear of getting beaten up and humiliated, and how that fear drove him to new heights. Greg Jackson shared that George's ability to overcome this fear and perform at such a high level again and again was one of the things that he admired most about him. I always appreciated how brave he was. Like, he was always so nervous to go and fight. And I really respected that about George. Like, there's people that, they're two percenters, right? They just don't feel fear the way the rest of us do. And so they don't have to deal with that pressure. They don't have to deal with a lot of that stuff. They just go out and have fun. They love to fight. They love it. And then there's guys that fighting is really hard for. And so it takes so much more strength of character for those guys to do it than the guys that, you know, love it. And, you know, they get nervous. Everybody gets nervous. It's very natural. But George would get really nervous. And he was so brave. Because he was so nervous, it took so much courage to counter that, right, and to kind of overcome it. And so the, just the courage he exhibited throughout his career is very inspiring. Like, it, like that guy was really nervous, and he didn't let that shut him down at all. As a matter of fact, he showed through it. And uh, I think that's very important, especially for young fighters, to kind of uh, study, to be like, wow, that guy, he used to get really nervous like I did. But it didn't, it didn't detract from his performance and enhance. That's really cool. George St. Pierre was born on May 19, 1981, in Saint Isidore, Quebec, Canada, a farming community just outside Montreal. His father, Roland, was a flooring and carpet installer, while his mother, Pauline, worked at a nursing home. In school, he would often find himself in the company of older students. His school had a special program where they would take in students who were struggling academically. He would often be around students who were multiple years older than him. He was a self-described nerd and had a hard time making friends when he was young. Bullies would steal from him and beat him up on a regular basis. He would sit as close to the bus driver as he could on his way home from school as a deterrent, but this did little to stop the bullying. One day he came home from school with bruises. He didn't want to talk about it, but his father demanded, so he broke down in tears and told his father that a bully had beaten him up. He said he couldn't do anything because the kid was bigger and stronger than him. His father was a black belt in Kyokushin Karate and introduced him to it when he was seven years old. His father's busy work schedule made it impossible for him to train him full time. So after a couple of years, he took him to an academy to train under Jean Couture. Yeah, Jean Couture, I was like nine years old when I started training with him. So that's uh, my dad first and Jean Couture was the, the, the second. Once he started doing karate, he began gaining more confidence in himself and quickly became less vulnerable to bullying. He had an issue one day, at around this time, where a couple of kids spit on him and his friend. He decided he finally had enough and fought back. He eventually wound up on the ground getting kicked repeatedly, but by the end of it, he'd gained their respect. Karate became somewhat of a salvation for him during this time. It really did help me with my, uh, with my confidence, and um, uh, because I was bullying at school, getting bullied, so uh, I needed to do something in order to, to gain confidence. And uh, that's, that's what Karate helped me with. By the time he was 12 years old, he had already become a second degree black belt. He continued to train with Jean Couture until Couture's death a couple of years later. Because he died, he died of uh, lung cancer when I was a teenager. Around, uh, I think, 14, 15 years old. Following Couture's passing, George went on the train with a martial artist named Christophe Midou who later became one of his closest mentors and friends. He also started branching out and exploring other disciplines, like Muay Thai. It was around this time when he got his first glimpse of the Ultimate Fighting Championship. Watching Hoyce Gracie use Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu to defeat three opponents in one night made him think about new possibilities in martial arts. It was at this moment that he realized his dream of becoming a professional fighter. Most people in North America weren't familiar with Jiu-Jitsu in the mid-90s, George decided to jump on a bus and travel to New York City, where MMA and Jiu-Jitsu legend Henzo Gracie had opened a gym. 
He stepped off of a bus and onto a mat with one of Henzo's top students at the time, five-star martial arts founder and fourth-degree black belt, Sean Williams. Sean teach me some incredible move, like the, the, the detail of the move, how he was teaching it. It was very different. It's something that I had never seen before. Even I couldn't speak English. The detail, the way he was teaching, it was fantastic. So right away, I, the teaching in New York at Hanzo Grace Academy, I, I saw it. It was a big gap, like technically how they were teaching it. Like that was like the pure form of jiu-jitsu, you know? It was like, you know, when, when you, you play phone games sometimes, like the, the thing get lost sometimes, but this is like pure, like from Hanzo directly to Sean and Sean right to me in the class. So I've learned all those little details, even though I couldn't speak English, I, like when he was demonstrating, I, I was like picking it up real fast. It was unbelievable. Sean saw something in George pretty early on. Yeah, just a guy, a, a kid that was really eager to learn, very athletic. Um, had a very good energy about him, a tremendous energy about him. Just seems like he's always like uh, fired up for everybody, and um, you know, a real team player. And George found a bit of success when rolling with some of the students there during his first class. And now after uh, two, like three or four technique, it's time to roll. So I start rolling with some of the guy, and I was doing very well with the blue belt. You know, the blue belt, the purple belt. I was like good. You know, I was doing very good. And then Sean William, he, he sees he sees that, he, and Sean is a little bit smaller than me, maybe 15 pounds, 10, 15 pounds smaller than me. Then he look at me, he goes, "Hey, uh, you, come with me." So uh, the last run I did with Sean William, I remember he he, he made me tap like five times in five minutes. I even remember that he did the move called the go-go platter. I didn't even know what was a go-go platter at the time. I just I just knew that I was getting choked up and I had to tap. Otherwise, I pass out. And after I finished rolling with him, it was the first time in my life that I ever got my ass kicked by a guy who was like 10 to 15 pounds lighter than me. The feeling that I had was I felt overwhelmed. Like I, I didn't didn't understand what happened because with the gi, I tried to use my strength, my size advantage. It didn't work. Like Sean was playing literally with me. Rolling with Sean was a humbling experience for George and even left him feeling a little discouraged. And then after the class, I, I, I told myself in my mind, I'm like, there is no way in the world I will become as good as this guy. This guy is so good. He's unbelievable. So I felt a little bit, not down, but you know, at that time, I, I wanted to be champion in MMA and, and I was studying and I was working very hard. So, And I think Sean saw it on my face. And it, even though we couldn't really communicate it, after the class, like, I tried to, to hide it. I was smiling and he came to me and he said, hey, uh, he said something like, hey, where are you from? I said, I'm from Montreal. And he, and he tapped me on the back. He said, you know, you know, jiu-jitsu, it's a game. It's like a chess game. He said, uh, you're very strong. You're very good, athletic, but I have a lot more knowledge than you do. And that's why I beat you so, so easy. And if you come back and keep training with us, one day you'll, you'll be just as good, you know, and you'll be able to, to be as good. And I, I even, I remember, I even told, uh, he told him at the time, I said, when you go with Hanzo, is Hanzo get the best out of you? He said, yeah, most of the time he tapped me. I'm, so I could, I was thinking in my mind how bad my level was compared to the Grandmaster Hanzo because Sean kicked my ass easy. Then Sean told me that when you go with Hanzo, Hanzo kicked it. So I was like, holy shit, I have a lot of work to do. If, I, if one day I want to go pro and be world champion, I have like a lot of work to do, like, so it seems to me at the time impossible, and I almost quit right there. Like on my way, on my way back in Montreal, I remember I drove. Like it, it, it was like eight, seven hour dri dri driving, and I had a lot of time to think to myself. And I was like thinking, like fuck it, man. How can I do what? What I'm gonna do? And I said, you know what? I said, fuck it. I'm gonna go back in there work my ass off and learn new skills, you know, because it's, you know, because I, I thought I had, I had a, an advantage on other people because of my, my, my karate. I was already a black belt in karate, but like, man, that was not enough. Like that was something completely different. And I got taken out of my comfort zone totally. So I told myself, you know what, I got to go back there, step on my ego, learn these new skills and train with the best and make all the sacrifice. He began traveling back and forth from Montreal to New York to train every couple of months, or as often as he could. After he graduated high school, he attended a public college called CEGEP, Edward Montpetit. But by the time George was 20 years old, 
he had dedicated himself to become a professional fighter. He was living in a rundown apartment, training, studying, and working three jobs. Resurfacing floors, bouncing at bars, and picking up trash. This was one of the most challenging periods of his life from a work standpoint. His first professional fight came in January of 2002 at UCC7 against Ivan Menjavar, where he went on to win by TKO after landing a barrage of punches. He continued training at Henzo's as often as he could, and it was around this time when he first met John Danaher. At that time, he was very, very young and uh, not really known at all. He was fighting in the local Canadian scene and local Canadian MMA shows and just really just standing out in the world. And he came in whenever he could. I believe he was working as a garbage man when he first uh, came and spoke almost no English and would observe techniques, try to do them as best he could, and then uh, uh, roll the beginning statement. Then he would stay for the more advanced class afterwards and uh, get in as much training as he could, usually coming in on the Friday night, staying for Saturday and Sunday, and then leaving to go back to work uh, in, in Canada. John was impressed with George almost immediately, not only with George's attitude and abilities, but also with his dedication. He was taking a bus, coming in all that way, so you know, that was a huge investment of time on his part. And uh, he's crossing an international border to uh, come down and do training, uh, six and a half to seven hours away by bus, and uh, come in for the weekend and, and, and train. So you could see already what kind of uh, investment he was making in himself, uh, and what kind of sacrifices he was making in order to, to pursue his dreams. Jordan would submit Justin Bruckman with an armbar at UCC 10, knock out Travis Garbraithit with elbows to the head, and finish Thomas Denny with punches. In his last fight before entering the UFC, he would face a dangerous striker and veteran Pete Spratt, who was coming off of a win over Robbie Lawler. When we spoke with Pete, he shared that he was at a disadvantage from the beginning due to not having his cornerman with him. I mean, I felt I was out of the fight from the beginning, considering that I was there with no corner man, no coach, and any of that. I basically showed up to the fight by myself because my corner wasn't permitted into Canada at that particular time. So there was a there was a big issue uh, for me personally and mentally uh, because I was there by myself. I didn't have a corner. Pete shared that he and George were scheduled to fight once before and had actually spent a little bit of time together at an event prior to the fight. George is A plus people, man. There, there's not a lot of people in the game that you can say is a 100% good, genuine dude. And that's who George is, man. He's very genuine, very helpful, very giving. He's, he's a great guy, man. I, I have, I have nothing bad to say about GS2, man. He, he's a great dude. George would go on to submit Pete with a rear naked choke in the first round. I mean, he was really strong. I was su surprised at how strong he was. And uh, you know, at that point, standing up and not being able to shake him off, I pretty much knew that, you know, the fight was probably going to be over at that particular point. The UFC welterweight champion at the time, Matt Hughes, and his manager, Monty Cox, were in attendance for the fight and decided to play a prank on George. Monty shares. We were up in, in Montreal for a TKO event, and we were we had just finished the weigh-ins, and everyone was standing around, and, and St. Pierre was brand new, but Matt was one of his heroes. And so I talked to Stefan, and I go, look, let's pull a, pull a joke on George. And I, I go, you go over and tell him the UFC just called, and they wanted to fight Matt Hughes. And so he did, and uh, and George was, like, kind of freaking out and everything, and, and we walked away. And then Matt, we had Matt go rushing over and go, so you think you're good enough to fight me? You're going to fight me? Is that what's going to happen? Blah, blah. And he's like, no, no, I didn't know. I'm so sorry. I, you know, but... I was almost shitting in my pants when they, they, they told me that. They were like, oh, yeah, he's going to have it. I'm like, hell, fucking no. I'm not even at the UFC yet. And then we all started laughing. And he goes, what? And, and uh, Stefan says, uh, it was a joke. And he's like, he's like, a joke? He goes, oh, shit. He goes, I got to call my parents. <laughs> and he had, he had already called his parents and told them he's fighting Matt Hughes. George would find himself in the UFC a short time later. His first fight in the UFC would be against judo expert Carl Parisian at UFC 46. Parisian was a rising star himself who specialized in clinch work, throws, and submissions, especially arm locks. Carl realized right away that George was different from the other guys he faced. Watch, in the beginning, the first round, 
I preferred him in my guard because I knew I was going to submit him. And I came really close a few times. I cannot believe how he slipped out of the arm triangle. I mean, I was like, what? Because uh, it was kind of weird. This fight saw George on top of Caro, delivering ground and pound with Caro trying to work different submissions. Caro nearly submitted George early in the third with a beautiful Kimura attempt. Dude, I saw I, mm, George ripped his muscle. I remember him ripping something because I saw his, I saw two kind of like, um, how were you, like a, you hit, you hit a fucking long ass worm and it was, it was like it rolled up a couple of the fucking joints and the muscles. He told me afterward, he said I had enough air in my lungs to do one last bridge and I did. He said and I escaped and I got in your guard and my base was not off, was not strong on top of him because I was freaking tired as hell. George would survive the round and go on to upset Parisian with the unanimous decision. John Danaher shared that this win wasn't the result the UFC had in mind. You realize he was supposed to lose that match. Like the, the UFC, Tyler Persian was a star at that time. And uh, he was one of the biggest names in that weight division at that time. And uh, the UFC was feeding George to him as, you know, he's another easy room to, to get Tyler ready to fight for a title. And this kid came out of nowhere. And the UFC realized they had a potential star on their hands. And they brought him in as just some guy to be beaten by Tyler Persian. And he ended up beating Cairo. And uh, you could... Even in that match, you can see the, the early development, that, that ability to, uh, to use distance as a weapon and then create situations where even a very, very talented and, and tough opponent like Caro really struggled to deal with George's ability to, to cover distance. And every time he threw a punch, George is in on his hips. And um, that Caro was able to use judo skills to counter some of the takedowns, but not enough. And, and George got an amazing first victory. In his next fight, he would knock out undefeated up-and-comer Jay Haran in under two minutes. His record was now 7-0, and he was starting to get a lot of attention. His next fight would be against Matt Hughes at UFC 50. This would be for the UFC welterweight title, after BJ Penn vacated it to compete for K1. Pat Militich and Hughes had been watching George for a while, and knew that he would be a problem for them in the future, but they didn't feel it was his time yet. I mean, we made statements publicly that we knew that George would eventually be a, be a champion. We knew he was very good, um, but we let him know that he was not ready to be a champion. Um, and so the, the, we, we were playing mind games right away, you know, with him, uh, because he was still young. And in my mind and Matt's mind, we just definitely felt that, that he was not quite ready, although he was very good at that point. Their strategy going into the first fight was to lean on Matt's wrestling prowess and experience in the cage. To make George wrestle and make him uh, scramble, make him, you know, create scrambles, create stuff that, that would get George in trouble, getting caught by somebody with more experience. MMA legend Jeremy Horn was also in Matt's corner. He shared that while Matt was one of the best wrestlers in MMA at the time, he was also proficient as a submission grappler. Matt actually really enjoyed grappling a lot. You know, people have a incorrect view of him. You know, he was big, strong farm boy wrestler, you know, and that's what he presented when he fought. But he actually was, he really enjoyed grappling, and he would always be the first one to grab somebody and pull them on top of him so he could work from his guard. You know, and obviously not when he was fighting, but in training, he, you know, he, he really was trying to learn and explore grappling. He was actually quite good. At the end of a competitive first round, George attempted a Camaro lock, but after overcommitting to it, Matt countered and transitioned into an armbar that submitted George at 4 minutes, 59 seconds of the first round. George talked about their stare down before the fight and confirmed Militich and Hughes' assessment that he wasn't quite ready yet. If you look at the stare down, I cannot even look at him in the eyes because I look at the ceiling because I'm, I'm so, I just can't believe what is going on. You know, I went in the fight to, to not lose instead of going to the fight to win. I lost that fight even before it started. In his next fight, he would head back to his old stomping grounds at TKO to face Dave Strasser. He would submit Strasser with a Camaro lock in January of 2005, in what would be his last fight outside of the UFC. Jason Mayhem Miller would be his next opponent. Joe Rogan said during the broadcast that he felt Miller had the advantage on the ground, but George quickly showed that wasn't the case. Miller tried slowing him down by using his rubber guard a couple of times, but it did little to weather the storm. George was able to pass Miller's guard at will and deliver heavy ground and pound and route to a unanimous decision. 
It was at around this time when he would receive his third degree black belt in Kyokushin. A message came to him from the legendary Kanchu Matsui, who studied directly under the founder of Kyokushin Karate, Mas Oyama. You know, I didn't have like a pass test like normally you do, traditional way, so it was more honorific uh, <clears throat> ways. And he came in Montreal and he, he's, uh, you know, because of all my fight, my career, I guess he followed, he followed me. And, um, and I know who he was, you know, because the Kyokushin had different branch that broke up when Master Yama dies. And he's one of the leader of one of the branch and uh, the brand chief of, uh, of Canada. Um, uh, the, the boss of Canada is André Gilbert, his name. So he told me, he, he reached out to me, he said, hey, Gaucho Matsui is in, he's in uh, Montreal and he would like to, to see you. Receiving a third degree black belt is a huge accomplishment, but for George, the belt itself was inconsequential. The, be- the belt is only here to tie up your pants. It, it has no meaning. The, the thing that means a lot to me is who I got it from. The fact that Gaucho Mount Matsui himself in Japan noticed my, me, and the fact that he wanted to give me the belt, that's more what, what is the meaning for me. It's not the belt, it's, it's, it's that the honor that I have to be in presence of Gaucho Matsui, him delivering me the belt, like it's, it's a very huge privilege for me. His next opponent would be Frank Trigg. In an interview prior to this fight, Trigg referred to George as a B-level fighter. Frank was known for being a good trash talker, but in this fight, he wasn't trying to play games with George's head. He really didn't see George as being much of a threat to him. And this fight wasn't supposed to be like all that tough for me. You know, it was like supposed to be like, okay, you're the guy, you're the second best guy in the weight class. Go back out there, beat this kid. Well, you'll beat one more guy, and then you'll have you know, we'll have to start talking about a, a third run at the title. You know, because there's nobody else, because you're beating everybody else up. It's kind of the, the mindset going into that fight. Frank shared his thoughts from the fight. My ankle gave out. I couldn't. I could not defend anything anymore. He takes me down off off my shot. He, he blows. You know, he gives me hip pressure and blows through me. I roll over, give him my back, and I tap out. And that's it. That's basically the whole fight. You know, it might it might even take longer for me to explain the fight than the actual footage of the fight. <laughs> it's like one of those fights. George would next face Sean Shirk, who came into this fight with a 31-1-1 and record. Known as the Muscle Shark, Shirk was an exceptional wrestler with great physical strength. It was another challenge for George to see if he would be able to grapple with a world-class wrestler. Game plan was to out-wrestle him, more or less. You know, I wanted to come in there and establish a striking game and set up some takedowns and get on top of him and kind of put him in a position where he had never been in. I'd never seen him getting taken down and grounded and pounded before, so... My goal was to come out there and uh, just utilize my wrestling ability and try to establish uh, a strong ground game. Shirk knew George's size could give him issues. Good size Walter Waite, so not a small fellow. Uh, moved very well, and I know he had uh, been training. Um, I believe he was training with the Olympic Canadian Olympic wrestling team at that point in time, and I had heard, you know, he's great, great wrestling. And obviously, before I fought him, I watched a lot of video and studied. So, uh, so I knew it wasn't going to be an easy task. But, uh, you know, I, I assumed I'd be able to take him down at some point in time and kind of impose, impose my will a little bit. Shirk was a game competitor, but George would go on to overwhelm him with punches and finish the fight with a TKO three minutes into the second round. George was focusing a lot of his energy on developing his wrestling game during this time. I think, I think wrestling, it's a very good sport in terms of also conditioning for, for making your, yourself stronger. Because... If you wrestle, if if you if you fight against a bodybuilder, you want. I mean, a bodybuilder will be good to lift weight, but if you fight him, you won't feel as as strong. You go against a wrestler or a judo guy. These two sports make you the strongest. I think in terms of, I'm talking about torque. I'm talk, talking about giving your opponent some resistance in terms of of body, pure strength and resistance. I think these are the best sport to give resistance, and that's why I choose wrestling. It was around this time when he first met Carl Massaro, who would soon become one of his main training partners. I first met him when I was a purple belt, and he was a purple belt. I remember we trained together, and I, he was taking the regular class. So he, 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 same thing. You know, He was already starting to get his face on billboards and such, but he would just walk into handles just like anyone else. He didn't expect any special treatment. Put on his gi, took the class, and we used to drill together. Carl spoke a little bit of French as well, so he and George quickly became friends. His next fight would be one of the toughest of his career. His opponent, BJ Penn, 
was considered by many to be one of the best pound-for-pound -pound fighters in the world at the time. With wins over Matt Hughes and Henzo Gracie, George knew BJ would be a big challenge. He was also a world champion in jiu-jitsu, so George knew his ground game would need to improve by leaps and bounds in a hurry. He asked Carl for advice. Uh, he asked me one night, he goes, Who, who's good to take a private with? And I pointed John Danner. I said, you know, John Danner, even in like 2005, John was already amazing, uh, although the rest of the world didn't know about it yet. And I said, you need to take a private with John Danner. I said, he's one of the better guys here. And I remember the next day, I saw George back in the academy, and he goes, Carl, he goes, he goes, fucking incredible, man. He goes, fucking John threw me around like an old garbage bag. He goes, it was like a Muppet. He goes, this guy's amazing. So, you know, I don't know what George's relationship was like that before with John, but they started taking privates like that after. And um, they, uh, yeah, they hit it off. and It was a perfect, perfect combination. John recalls the first time they trained together. And I uh, came in and took an afternoon class, which I was teaching. I remember I, I uh, aspired with him after the class, and uh, he expressed an interest in doing private classes and having me help him get ready to fight BJ Penn. That was a tough fight for George. You know, he was only a purple belt at that time, and he was very worried fighting BJ Penn, who was a world champion black belt and very renowned for his skills on the floor. So um, he asked me to help him get ready for that that fight, and uh, that was the first time I ever cornered George. This was the beginning of what would become the nucleus of George's coaching staff, with John and Faraz. I met the, the very, very young Faraz Sahabi, who was, uh, wasn't George's coach in those days, he was one of George's training partners. I remember going out to Las Vegas, and, and, and that's where it all began. George knew it would be a tough fight, and he felt it right away, as BJ battered him around the ring during the first round. Within the first minute, George's eye was swollen and bleeding, and his nose was broken. What followed would be one of the gutsiest performances of his career. He kept pressing forward, despite the damage, and won the final two rounds. He'd go on to win a split decision over BJ. Some thought this decision was controversial, because George's face took excessive damage, while BJ hardly had a scratch on him. He didn't have time to question the decision, though. His next fight would be for the welterweight title against Matt Hughes at UFC 65. At this point, Hughes had reached legendary status. After his win over George at UFC 50, he went on to beat Hoyce Gracie, BJ Penn in their rematch, and a spectacular win over Frank Trigg in their second fight. It was around this time when he first started training with a John Phil nurse. George provided Phil with some tape on Hughes' fights to study. After I saw it, and I felt I saw a lot of weaknesses, I started breaking it down. I was like, okay, George, this is what we need to work on. And this is the thing that impressed me, that as a, as a coach, when you show your fighters the game plan, or you tell them, we're going to work on this technique, and this technique, and this technique, if you teach your fighter 10 things, and they come out of the competition or the fight, and they've accomplished three, it's, it's pretty decent. It's not, it's not bad. But when I was telling George to work on things, he went back to Montreal, and he would work on all of those moves. And when it did come down to the fight, um, he actually flew me out to, I think it was Sacramento at the time. When it actually did come down to that fight, I can honestly say he pulled off out of the, I'd say 10 things we worked on for that fight, he pulled off at least like seven of them in that fight. And that was, it was like huge. You know, I was like, what? I can't believe it. And I wasn't even in the corner at that time. I was up in the stands. You know, he just really stuck to the game plan and it made that fight so easy walk through Matt Hughes and that was his biggest challenge and he'd been beat once by him and you know he, he finished it. One of the moves that Phil showed George during their first camp together became one of his signature moves. You know I kind of showed him a Superman punch and when I showed him that he was he, he grasped on that like right away. Like I remember when I did he's like oh coach what was that? I know like, oh, it's a Bruce Scott flying punch. So I was like oh it's a flying punch. Now it got called a Superman punch, but it was a flying punch when I taught him at the beginning, but it's the same thing. And um, he picked that up immediately, and I was like, George, okay, I want you to make this punch yours. Because he picked it up so fast. He was, like, really smooth. It's not that easy to do, especially on the left side. It's not that easy to do. A lot of people say, oh, I can do it, I can do it, I can do it. They, they have a version of it. It's something you really got to connect and know your balance and know your body and have to be accuracy with it. And he picked it up, and 
he was so smooth with it. And I was like, okay, George, this is what I need you to do. I need you to practice this from distance. I need you to practice this going sideways. I need you to practice this from a takedown. I need you to practice this going back. I need you to practice this from all different angles. I don't, I don't, you, like, it don't matter what angle you're in or what position you're in, I need you to just be able to throw this punch. And I know he used to, he used to go and practice it and he had it where he could do it from anywhere. And that's why when he used to say to me in later years, he'd be like, oh, coach, they're going to know what I'm going to do. I'm like, George, no one's going to see it coming. We have so many variations to this punch. No one's going to see it coming. And to this very day, you know, even till he retired, no one ever stopped that punch yet because there's so many different variations to how we approach it that nobody ever sees it. George was a bit starstruck by Hughes in their first contest. In this fight, that wouldn't be the case. He used his reach advantage to land stiff jabs and low kicks until he caught him with what looked like a low blow midway through the round that stopped the action. He was quickly recovered, but as soon as they resumed action, George threw a similar kick that appeared to hit him low again. The plan was to hit low kick, low kick, and when he went to grab it for the rest of whatever base it was, to go high kick. Now, in the fight, George was doing the low kicks really well, like not all the time, but just putting them in there. And Matt Hughes complained that George hit him in the groin. And the referee stopped and gave George a warning. And for me, up until that point, everything was going perfect. And I was like, and like I said, I wasn't in the corner, so I couldn't shout anything, not to be heard. And I was thinking, this is great, this is awesome. And then when he did that, I was like, oh, it's out the window now. Like the referee's just giving him a warning, and that the game plan stopped because he's not like, more than likely he's not going to kick him again. You know, referee's just warned him about doing it. And what I was proud about, immediately the referee said, okay, fight, give George a warning, don't hit the groin again, which he hadn't done. We didn't know that at the time, but, you know, he said, fight. And the first thing does George does is go straight back to the leg again, which I was really, really proud of that because the plan was to sell that low kick to make him go for the leg to bring the high kick. And you had to sell the legs, hitting the legs or whatever to get the high kick to the finish. So I was really, really proud of him when he went straight onto the low kick. If you go back on the tape, you'll see he gets warning, and then the first thing he does is back to the leg again with the leg kick. And then afterwards is when we found out Matt Hughes said, no, it didn't hurt my leg. It didn't hit me in the groin at all. It was just hurting my leg. So I just pretended it hurt my groin to think he would stop, but he didn't. He kicked me right back there again. George continued pressing the action and nearly finished Hughes with strikes on the ground at the end of the first round. George came back out in the second round and started kicking his legs again, which frustrated the champion. He dropped Hughes a minute later with a head kick and finished him with punches a few seconds later. After Big John McCarthy stopped the fight, George jumped up in joy and then dropped to the mat with his head in his hands. He compared this moment with the honor he received from Kancho Matsui. Like I, when I won my, my title, my world title against Matt, it was, yeah, it's a, it's a world title. It's cool, it's my, it was my first. But I won it against Matt Hughes, the guy that dominated an entire division for many years. He was like the best of his time. And that's when I got it, and I got it from Matt Hughes. That's when it was at the meaning, it was even more for me. He would make his first title defense against Henzo Gracie's first American Jiu Jitsu black belt, UFC Hall of Famer Matt Serra. Serra was known for having powerful hands and excellent submissions. Mike Goldberg commented that George had the tools to rule the welterweight division for a long time. No one was expecting what came next. Sarah hit George with a huge right hand that immediately staggered him. Sarah kept the pressure on him, knocking him down a few seconds later, and then finishing the fight from the full mount position. It was an embarrassing loss for George. Phil Nurse shared the advice he had for him afterward. And I remember thinking back to what I'd been through in the past. I'm like, listen, this can turn out to be the best thing that ever happened to you. Give yourself some time because it was the best thing that ever happened to him. He started, he just really focused. He didn't like losing like that at all. He knew the work that he had done to get there and then for it all to be gone in like one round. And what I think happened in the fight, you know, he he just, he wasn't as sharp and alert as he needed to be. And it was only a split second. His mind, he lost concentration for a split second, and that's all it takes. You know, if I remember rightly, on the night when we were talking about it, he, he said he just started questioning himself for a second, like, you know, I, I'm the champion, and like, 
you know, um, and he just went off of, you know, being about being or whatever it was, just a split second, and then boom, like, it was, it was all over. In reality, it was the best thing to ever happen to him. Following his loss to Sarah, George dominated the sport for the next six years, winning 12 fights in a row. He would make his return to the octagon about four months later, against another top grappler, Josh Koscheck, at UFC 74 in August of 2007. Koscheck was a four-time NCAA All-American wrestler in college, and he also had a knack for using his words to get under people's skin. Koscheck was coming off of a win over Diego Sanchez and indicated that Sanchez was a greater challenge to him than George will be. Koscheck's head trainer at the time, Bob Cook, shared how Koscheck didn't see George's wrestling as much of a threat. I do think that he underestimated him in the first fight. I, I think he, uh, I, I think he underestimated his wrestling. You know, his ability to be able to get a takedown. Craig Jackson said their strategy for George going into this fight was to target Koscheck's wrestling and beat him in his own game. We just followed one of the victims of combat, which is uh, it's kind of anti Sun Tzu. But if you attack an opponent's strength and they don't have, and your strength is much greater, then they don't have a second place to go, right? So we knew Koscheck would do everything but train to defend wrestling. Because at that time, George was kickboxing almost everybody. He would do takedowns here and there, but the majority of his work was done stand-up stuff. So everybody was kind of really getting used to, you know, he had good takedowns, but, um, uh, and he, you know, he grappled, obviously. But it, everybody was really afraid of his stand-up, so we knew he trained that way. Um, and then so just to flip the script, we went after Koscheck's strengths, and then we were able to uh, uh, kind of execute that. George had Koscheck on his back in the corner of the octagon within the first 30 seconds and was passing his guard a minute later. He'd go on to win a unanimous decision in a fight that he dominated from start to finish. After this fight, George took the microphone and pleaded with Dana White to bring the UFC to Montreal for an event. He would get his wish soon enough, but first, he had to settle the score with Matt Hughes at UFC 79. Hughes was originally slated to face Matt Serra, but Serra had to withdraw due to an injury. George was happy to step up and face Hughes on 30 days notice. Craig shared how George was on a mission in their third fight to settle something that was still bothering him from their first contest. George is one of those fighters that you could game plan specifically for each range, meaning that, you know, if, you, uh, if you're on the outside, you're going to do certain stuff. If you go in and grapple, you're going to do certain stuff. But I think that one was a personal one for George because Matt had teased him about getting arm barred. And so I, I know that George, sometimes fighters get something in their head. He really wanted to arm bar Matt back, right? Because George has a lot of pride. He's a very humble guy, but as you have to, as a champion, he has a lot of pride as well. So when Matt was teasing about him, I think that hit home. And so uh, the third time he wanted, to, I think he wanted to put a stamp on it and make sure like, oh, you know, uh, this is how I arm bar you. And so uh, I think that the, the game for me was getting there. But once you, once you got there, George, George was going to do it no matter. You could tell George, don't touch him. And he was still going to take him down an arm bar. You know what I mean? So uh, that wasn't not the game plan, but I kind of had a feeling that's where it was going to go. George showed that he was just too much for Hughes at this point. Matt did well at times, but George would go on to submit him with an arm bar at the end of the second round. As gratifying as his win was, his top priority was getting a rematch against Matt Serra for the welterweight title, which would come the following spring in April 2008 in his hometown of Montreal. When it came time for him to fight, he was often busy during the week with media events and other obligations. Fight week can become hectic for fighters, and there were times when George would want to get away for a little while with his team, as Phil Nurse shares. I know another thing about George sometimes, you know, when we were getting ready for fights, you know, we'd be in a town getting ready for the fight on a fight week, and all of a sudden, George would just call us all, all of his coaches, like, hey, guys, I want to go for a drive. And all that drive would be, he would say, right, just get, let's get in the car and let's just go for a drive. Just, I want to have my army and my team around me and just drive. And we wouldn't necessarily even talk. We would all come out, get in the car, and just drive around. And in that time, I knew where George's mind was at. He would be analyzing, like perfecting it in his mind before we even got into the octagon, just driving about, you know? And I think that was a, a, something that, you know, people just look at George, oh, he's just a great fighter. But he thought about it. He, you know, he put it together. He did the work. He did the training. He did whatever he was told. He just did it. And so it, it just became where he was. You know, he was, he was ahead of everybody else. I think guys are getting there now, but he was he was way ahead. 
even think now anyone to fight him now will have trouble. He still can hold his own with them all. Probably still beat him. George was under enormous pressure to win the rematch with Sarah. Maybe more pressure than he ever felt in his life. Phil told a story about a situation where George wanted to leave the hotel and go for a ride, but it wasn't really possible with the amount of people around, so they had to get a little creative. One time he was fighting in Montreal, one of those same nights where George was like, oh, I want to go out, but the hotel was packed with fans, with people who came to see the fight. We were in the hotel. The hotel lobby, elevators came down right into the lobby, and the, aisle, the lobby was packed with fans like you couldn't budge and if we went down as coaches the minute one of them saw us the elevator would open they would all look at the elevator to see who was coming out and if they saw us they all would be George immediately and someone suggested that George should put a, a disguise on and we were all laughing about it thought it was funny but then we decided to try it so George put on this like a, I think it was like a you know Jasper Carrot that red wig he has on thing yeah. He put like a red like a red wig on his head, some gawpy glasses and a little peak hat. And you know, the elevators all came down into the lobby, so it was like five elevators. So what did we decided and George wanted to go out, he was coach, I mean wait, I gotta go for a drive, I gotta get out, I gotta just drive, you know, a couple of hours driving around and then we'll come back and relax. So we're like, Well how are we gonna get out? So then that's when this thing came up. So we get in the elevator. And we're like, okay, let's split up. You, we're all the coaches going one ele- one elevator. When the doors open, they're all going to look. They're all going to look for George with us, but he's not going to be with us. He's going to be in the other elevator, the other side of us. They all looked up in front of everybody. So that's what we did. So we came down. The elevator opens. All the fans look straight at us. And they're looking to see if George is with us. But George is in the elevator at the side of us, in a, in a sense. The doors all open. George walked out to all of the fans. Nobody saw. He didn't know who he was. And then we walked out. And they're all like walking, like trying to see, like, where's George? Like, you know, so then by then they realized that George isn't with us. And then as we get outside the hotel and we're walking away, we start trying to congregate to meet up with George. And then somebody's like, hey, George. <laughs> it was so funny. And then we all ran like crazy. We just ran. And then, we, you know, the, the guy, the, Valley guy brought the car to some place and we got in the car. It was hysterical. It was so funny. Anyway, we got out of the hotel. I can't remember how we got back in, but we got out of the hotel. We went driving around. And I think when we got back, we had to call some secret entrance underneath the hotel or something to get back in. Sarah and George are both known for being gentlemen and great sportsmen, but there was a bit of animosity following their first fight after George said he shouldn't have taken the fight for various reasons. Sarah took offense to this and returned some comments of his own, telling George to drink some red wine, watch hockey, and shut up, which many took as a shot against Canadians. Sarah wasn't trying to disparage an entire country. He was just voicing his frustration, as he explains. I remember feeling offended like George was making excuses after the fight. And the the thing with the red wine was, you know, and I was calling him Frenchy, is because uh, it was right after the movie Talladega Nights was out, and it was kind of just fresh in my brain. So, you know, it wasn't, it, I was, is it mean spirited? I don't think if he told me to go eat a meatball sandwich, I'm not going to get upset. You know what I mean? So I was mad and, and I tried to use it as fuel. George is a very nice guy. You know what I mean? This fueled the fire for a fight that was already highly anticipated. These two didn't waste any time getting started. And George had this fight on the ground in the opening seconds. Sarah did his best to weather the storm, but was mostly dominated on the ground. Kenny Florian commented on the broadcast that George had Sarah's corner confused and had a huge advantage. George overwhelmed Matt in the second round and landed brutal knees to the body that ultimately ended the fight. Both fighters showed great respect toward one another afterward, but Sarah even picking George up and carrying him around the octagon. Sarah shared that in hindsight, he understood why George said the things that upset him. Everybody asked, you know, what happened, what happened? That guy he was never supposed to beat you. And so what is the guy supposed to say? Like he was just stating the truth. Nowadays, Sarah is friends with George, and he has a lot of respect for him. George is a, a, one of the best that ever did the game. He fought brilliantly in the rematch, and uh, he's one of, you know, again, I, I, I think he's a great human being. I, I, really, uh, I really like George a lot. John Fitch would be George's next opponent. 
Fitch was undefeated in the UFC and a former captain of the Purdue University wrestling team while training under MMA veteran Tom Erickson. Greg Jackson commented on how it was Fitch's mental strength that may have made him the most dangerous. If you go in and you not, let's say you knock Fitch down and you take him down and you start beating him up pretty good, he's just such a great guy at waiting until you make one mistake, you get a little bit too overzealous. So even that is a safety zone in a way, right, where he's very, very good at catching you right when you think you're going to catch him. So making sure that you stay disciplined, staying at 90% output instead of gassing yourself out trying to take him out. Prior to their fight, John said he was going to force George to stand and trade strikes. He would eventually get his wish in a way. Fitch's corner man at the time, Bob Cook, shared some of his thoughts on the fight. It was a matter of, you know, yes, standing up fighting, trying to get a t- got, trying to get his own takedown if he could, try to get in some dominant position. But, you know, George is very athletic and a great wrestler. And, uh, you know, it was, it was hard for Fitch to get any good positions that he usually does with with most of his adversaries. George had this fight on the ground in the first 10 seconds and basically took Fitch out of his game plan from the start. Fitch found some success in the second round and was beaming with confidence when he came out for round three. Anything that would sort of work, um, which we were <laughs> which we were struggling with, you know, uh, George stylistically was a very tough matchup for Fitch. George quickly dropped him with a huge right hand counter punch about 10 seconds into the round. George then took control and landed his most significant strikes of that fight later in the round, with a big right hand down the middle, followed by a left knee, a right high kick, and a hard right knee as Fitch went down. In the fifth round, Joe Rogan commented that it looked like George was just taking target practice at him. Fitch deserves a lot of credit for absorbing tremendous damage and fighting on, but George put the rest of the division on notice in this fight. BJ Penn entered the octagon immediately after the decision and challenged George to a rematch which was gladly accepted. George was named Canadian Athlete of the Year a few months later by Sportsnet.ca in December of 2008 after receiving 89% of the votes. He had little time to enjoy it though with his rematch against PJ Penn right around the corner. While most felt George won their first fight, he sustained a lot more damage than BJ, so there were plenty of people who felt the decision should have gone the other way. BJ commented on how George spent the night at the hospital following their fight while he spent the night at the bar. BJ questioned George's heart and toughness. He called George a quitter prior to their second fight and asked if George was willing to die in the cage like he was. Joe Rogan described this fight as being between two once-in-a-lifetime athletes. Greg Jackson shared their strategy going into it. BJ, we wanted to wear him down, right? To get him fatigued, to get him tired. And if you if you let BJ rest, he'll, he'll be all over you. BJ's longtime trainer, Jason Perillo, talked about how they were ready for anything but wanted to make this fight look a lot like the first one. We want to beat the guy in all areas. Obviously, we wanted to bust him up a little bit more. You know, if you watch the first fight, you know, BJ was was taking advantage of him. We want to challenge our feet most we can. Sure, what happened? BJ got taken down in the first couple of minutes, and not the first minute of the fight. Okay, so when he was on the ground, what was the strategy there? Obviously, try to work your way back up to your feet. Use a rubber guard to do it. See if you can drop some elbows while being in the rubber guard. You know, unfortunately, Jordan showed a lot of strength. And, you know, it, 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 it beat BJ. While it was quite competitive at first, as the rounds wore on, George used his size advantage to impose his dominance on the ground. By the time BJ went back to his corner following the third round, he looked tired and dejected. Jason talked about how he was growing more and more concerned. I was speaking it out loud while I was in the corner. I said, you know what, this keeps going this way. I'm going to stop this fight. You know, not that we have to gain out of this. There's no sign of us turning this around. We're not holding on to a knockout punch right now. It's not there. You know, so what's the point? What's the point of taking years of this man's life? Let's get him the fuck out of here. It's okay to take the loss and go home. In the fourth round, it was all St. Pierre. Mike Goldberg and Joe Rogan sounded a bit stunned on the broadcast as George dominated BJ on the ground. He poured on the strikes and almost finished him. After the round, St. Pierre jumped up and punched the cage in excitement as Penn struggled to hold himself up in the corner. Jason Perillo jumped up to look at BJ from over the cage and knew that it was time for him to intervene. For the few fights leading up to that fight, I basically lived with him, so I know him. I know I, I, and there's a clairvoyancy there in, in a sense. I know that this man is done. Fights like that, you know, 
put a great effect on your life because I wanted him to be able to come back. I, mean, I wanted him to have a little bit more of a future after that fight. And I knew that if he continued to take that shellac and that beating that he was taking, that uh, things could have been even worse. There's no question that BJ Penn is one of the greatest pound for pound fighters in sports history. But on this night, George is way too much for him, as Craig Jackson explains. That was a really fun fight in that. Um, we got uh, we really got to showcase kind of George's evolving skills, and everybody really got to kind of show a piece of that evolution. Uh, John Danahar, Phil Nurse, Ross, myself, everybody was really uh, working, kind of putting things together for George, and George obviously synthesizing it himself. But uh, that was a fun fight because of the uh, trying to get BJ tired, trying to set a good pace on him, moving into his strength, which is uh, his guard. He has a very good guard. Um, and being able to nullify that with uh, just kind of constant action, constant pressure. Uh, that that was the real deal there. So you, you could switch up your strategies, pushing him on the fence, trying to get him tired there, kickboxing him, but try to kind of systematically take away his, his safety zones by kind of that, that element of, of pushing, of not letting him get big breaths back. At this point, George had established himself as being quite possibly the greatest pound-for-pound -pound fighter in the world. He had dispatched Matt Hughes and BJ Penn in convincing fashion and was seemingly getting stronger with every fight. However, his next opponent, Tiago Alves, presented some different challenges than he had faced. Alves was a knockout artist who had won four of his last five fights by TKO, including wins over Matt Hughes, Carl Parisian, and Chris Lytle. He was coming off of a unanimous decision win over Josh Koscheck and was poised to challenge George for the world title at UFC 100. Phil Nurse took us back. He was very concerned about Alves. He definitely voiced that one to me specifically. Because he was like, "Gorge, he's a tight fighter. He does tight. He's a very good with his leg kicks. And I'm like, George, so are you. You're good with your leg kicks too. You're good at what you do. Phil told us some of the advice he shared with George going into the fight. Well, I, I told George, the kick has to hit you. If he can't find you, he can't hit you, and your timing is... The leg kick comes and you got him already and took him down, it's it's no use. You know, it's not gonna do anything. And you can kick him back too. You've got your own leg kicks. Don't let this aura about you know, Thai boxing it does have its, its strengths, but don't let this aura of Alves at the time just like beat you. Like know what you're what you're good at too and you can beat him. St. Pierre was able to take Alves down at will and dominate him on the ground. Alves was a dangerous striker and showed a good ability to escape and stand up but George was able to sap his power and explosiveness bit by bit with each takedown. Alvis showed a sense of urgency at the start of the third round and started to turn the tide a little with some good strikes, but George had it back on the ground a couple of minutes later, where he continued to wear Tiago down. Joe Rogan mentioned how Alvis wasn't able to dominate with his striking because George could do so many things to throw him off of his game. George would go on to win a unanimous decision. I remember after the fight, he won. We were walking back to the locker room he came running up to me so excited like coach did you see i i, I beat the the, the the muay thai guy i beat the muay thai guy i did like he's doing i beat the muay thai guy and i think he took him down like i don't know he, he took him down a lot of times i think it was like 18 times or something something crazy he took him down but he did stand with me his excitement was he stood up with the muay thai guy and he, he did kicks and he he just stood up the Muay Thai guy couldn't beat him because I know at first he was a little concerned about it. Greg Jackson shared that it was Alvis' ground game and preparation that impressed him the most. George left half guard ground and pound. That was one of our positions, and, and Alvis did a really good job of putting George on the defensive there. Um, so he, he, I was actually impressed with Alvis a lot on his game plan because he was ready for George's uh, half guard game. So I remember having to adjust that. I think that's the fight I told him to hit him with his groin as well when George was having a little uh, worried about his, an injury or something and I had to refocus him by saying something absolutely ridiculous, which I do often. So uh, I, I, is that the fight? I believe that's the fight. It was the fight. It was, yeah. it was, it was, it was yeah. the groin injury. Yeah. I'm such an idiot. Uh, <laughs> but I had to... I, I had to refocus him, and I had to kind of get him into that fighter mentality. Following this fight, it was revealed that George had torn his abductor muscle in three places and would need to be out of competition for a while. His next fight would come eight months later against Dan Hardy, who was riding a seven-fight win streak with recent victories over Mike Swick, Marcus Davis, and Roy Markham. Hardy was a brown belt under jiu-jitsu guru Eddie Bravo, 
and had knockout power on his left hook. He wanted to take Hardy down, and I think, I think he hurt his groin in that fight. He tried to like he tried to do an arm bar on Hardy, and I don't know if it, that's that's when he did it. But he did something to his groin in that fight, and I was trying to tell him to stand. He could stand, but I think he, I remember. Yeah, I think he hurt his groin. George had this fight on the ground within the first 15 seconds. Hardy quickly employed Eddie Bravo's rubber guard and tried locking in its mission control position, but St. Pierre shrugged it off almost instantly. George moved from one dominant position to another before getting Hardy in an armbar about 20 seconds left in the round. He straightened Dan's arm to where it appeared that Dan would submit, but he somehow managed to escape. He mostly took Hardy down at will throughout this fight. There were times where Hardy would escape, only to be back on the ground a couple seconds later. George got him in a Kimura near the end of the fourth round that looked like it was certainly going to end it. Joe Rogan said that it looked like St. Pierre was going to rip his arm off, but Hardy managed to escape from that as well. There was a part where he kind of had him down there and he couldn't get it finished for whatever reason. I think John did say that he broke it down after. John broke it down. You know, he was a science, like a science from the, the jiu-jitsu. He was like, you didn't have the arm a little bit over to the side. or Something he broke it down. He was like, that's why you couldn't get the finish on it. Dan deserves a lot of credit for being tenacious, but George dominated all aspects of this fight from start to finish. George would take a quick break from competition to take part of the Ultimate Fighter show as one of the coaches, along with his opponent, Josh Koscheck. There was a chance for George to help others, as Sean Williams shared. He's very passionate about people. He's, 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 a, he's a very caring, kind, humble guy that, that he really wants mid-on athletes to be like the best they, they could be. And he's, te- he's super technical I and mean, very, very technical. He's around technical human beings all the time. He always brings in the best people to train with. And I um, think that's been something that he's done for a long time. So he, that's what he wanted to go uh, amongst our athletes on that season was he brought in like the best of everybody to try to give uh, these guys that didn't have access to that um, before, had no, you know, some of them weren't from a place that had all of the, the best people uh, in the, on the planet, so he, he brought those guys in. There were plenty of moments on the show where Koscheck tried to get under George's skin. St. Pierre later admitted that Koscheck irritated him a few times and motivated him to train harder than ever before. Koscheck was very effective in becoming an antagonist to the Canadian fans and basically becoming public enemy number one prior to their fight. When he entered the arena for their rematch in Montreal, Koscheck was met with loud boos from the crowd. Koscheck also refused to touch gloves with George prior to their fight, which only further enraged the crowd. Koscheck had developed into a knockout artist between their fights and said he wanted to use his wrestling to keep this fight standing up, where he could land his big right hand. We knew Koscheck was a wrestler, a good wrestler, but he kind of got, got away from that a little bit, and he was kind of making swinging big right hands to try and knock people out, and I think he'd accomplished it a few times. After watching some film on Koscheck, Phil Nurse showed George a technique that would prove to be a difference maker in the fight. What we said to me is just drop your hands. Classic is, is head hunting. So he's only looking at you in the face. He's looking you dead in the face. He's trying to punch you in the face. He's just going straight for the face. Now, if you stand in front of somebody and you're just looking in their face and they drop their hand out of view, you can't see it. So after the first round was out of the way is when it was, it was the plan was to just, you're going to punch kind of up at an angle, not necessarily straight. If you punch straight, he's going to see your hand. But if you drop it out of view a little bit and bring it up, he's not going to see it. And by the time Kasek, I don't even think he ever realized what was happening, but by the time he realized what was going on, not knowing what was going on, but he realized like he wasn't being, he couldn't see and he was being punched in the face all the time. He, he I suppose he still doesn't know what was going on, but what it was was working because his hand was coming up. And by the time he's, I can't even say he's seen it, but at the time it was hitting him, it already hit him, he hadn't seen it coming. If it was in front, he would have seen it. And George just kept going the whole fight like that until Kostek couldn't see. He, his, eye, his eye was closed, he was just he's looking at your face, he's looking straight at you, your arm drops, he's not going to see your arm. He's not even see it coming until it hits. It's too late. In this fight, George would use his jab to throw Kostek off of his game and dominate the action. Kenny Florian shared in our interview how he's seen George use this jab in sparring sessions with professional boxers in the past. I've seen with a lot of pro boxers and his jab was menacing. I mean, it really was. That was the one thing that you really had to deal with. If you could not take away George St. Pierre's jab, even if you were a very good 
a pro boxer, you were going to be trouble. I mean, you, it was going to be difficult to deal with. In short, the Canadian crowd got what they wanted in this fight. St. Pierre inflicted heavy damage, breaking Koscik's orbital bone in the first round, and making it swell up instantly. When Josh returned to his corner, with his eye nearly swollen shut, the crowd responded accordingly. George became more and more comfortable as the fight wore on, mixing up combinations and loading up his punches. He eventually morphed his left jab into a left hook at times to inflict more damage. Bob Cook urged Koscheck to pressure George more. Koscheck deserves a lot of credit for his resiliency and ability to stop George's takedown attempts again and again, but George was just too much for him this night. He went on to win a unanimous decision in what was a brutal fight for Koscheck. Bob Cook reflected on their preparation and the fight itself. Well, you know, in the, in the second fight, Koscheck had uh, prepared very well and sharpened up his wrestling and uh, had all that together. And um, uh, unfortunately for us, uh, good job for George. He got that jab going real well, and Koss uh, uh, had an orbital blowout from the first round on. In his next contest, George would face a fantastic jiu-jitsu practitioner in Jake Shields. Jake was a decorated college wrestler and a Caesar Gracie black belt in Brazilian jiu-jitsu. He hadn't lost a fight in six years and won 15 in a row with wins over Dan Henderson, Robbie Lawler, and Paul Daly. George hadn't lost a round in four years coming into this fight. Jake did his homework. But he wasn't able to find many big weaknesses in George's game, as he explains. He's tough to get a beat. He doesn't have a lot of holes. Most guys usually should find one or two big you know, holes in their game, but he just you know, he moves so well. It's good jiu-jitsu, it's good striking, good wrestling. So there's no like, there's no glaring holes. You know, of course, you can find tiny little things here and there, but it's definitely not, not an easy guy to fight. George was thought to have better skills striking on their feet and did a good job keeping it there throughout the fight. He went back to using his jab and timed it well to catch shields a few times at moments when he was moving forward. He became looser with his strikes as the fight went on, throwing overhand rights and spinning back kicks more frequently. Shields pushed the action more in the third round and gave George a mouse under his eye that bothered him for the rest of the fight. George told his corner he couldn't see out of it, and Greg Jackson told him he was fine because he could see out of the other one. George actually told Greg Jackson that he was seeing double at one point, which led to Greg referencing a line from a classic movie. Oh, here, hit the guy in the middle, because that's an old Rocky thing. That's you can't the Rocky see, thing. Like, I'm seeing two, I'm seeing two, I'm seeing double, I'm seeing double. Or there's two of them in there or something like that, and then the, his trainer says, hit the one in the middle, which is, again, it's that same thing where you you have a medical concern, and uh, you have to assess as the trainer, you know what I mean? Like, can he work through this? And I mean, George is one of the most mentally tough physical athletes, genius fighters ever. So if anybody could work through that situation, it could be him. And I didn't think it was going to be a fight ending injury. I certainly didn't want it to be. But those are those moments and those judgment calls and it worked out for me. But uh, you, you have to make those in the corner where you're, you either push your guy on, like, come on, you got to do it. Or you're like, ah, okay, you know what I mean? The, the medical issue is too severe. Um, and in that case, uh, you know, George had another eye and, and we didn't want to tarnish his legacy. So uh, I really didn't think it was, I think, you know, I absolutely believe that he couldn't see for 100%, but I thought the vision would come. Sometimes you get gouged in the eye that you can't see for a minute or two, and then it comes back, and I thought that was going to be the case. George continued and landed a head kick that dropped Shields in the fourth round. Jake shared how the fact that it was later in the fight helped take some power off of it. Yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't like devastating. Obviously, it doesn't feel good, but it's, uh, it, it takes a lot when you're in a fight to really be shook. It was one of those things, especially in the later rounds. I think you're... Uh, you lose a little bit of power. It takes a lot to get a knockout later round. They see most of the knockouts like, you know, round one or two with a ton of power. So it definitely didn't feel good, but it wasn't like close to a, to a knockout or anything. Shields came back and broke George's nose later on in the round with a hard right cross that George probably didn't see coming. St. Pierre would go on to win a unanimous decision in a fight that he later described as one of the hardest of his career. Jake shared his thoughts on George's place among the sport's all-time greats in the both weight division. I think he's definitely one of the best best ever you know it, it's hard to say it, it's one of those things it's so subjective saying the best fighter ever especially when you go to pound for pound but i think certainly at 170 he's had the you know i would say he's the best best fighter in history ever you know at all weights you, know, you have you have several guys you can put out there guys like you know anderson silva john jones but he certainly uh certainly ranks up there with those guys his next fight was supposed to come about six months later against interim welterweight champion carlos condon this created an issue for one of his trainers craig jackson who was a longtime trainer for condon Jackson made the honorable decision to recuse himself from this fight. 
it killed me. It, yeah, about that. I didn't. I still have never watched that fight. And I never will. Uh, those are my guys. Yep. I, yeah. That at that time, especially for for where I was at that time, yeah, it was it was a terrible night because one of my friends had to lose. And yeah, I didn't like it at all. George suffered a torn ACL during his training for Condit, which delayed the fight for a full year while he recovered. He described the recovery as one of the greatest challenges of his career, and he would soon face one of his most dangerous moments in the octagon. Condon was dangerous in all areas, with good submissions, knockout power, and great stamina. This fight is probably most well known for the head kick that Carlos landed in the fourth, that almost finished the fight. Georgia jumped out to a lead on the scorecards by the fourth round, but when Carlos threw a faint punch and followed with a big left high kick that landed cleanly on George's head, many thought the fight was going to be over. George staggered backwards and fell to his back as Carlos swarmed on him. Condon landed several big punches and elbows as George worked desperately to weather the damage. George found his way back up after about a minute and quickly took Carlos back down. George would maintain a small edge throughout the rest of the fight to win a unanimous decision. In a fight with lots of blood, suspense, and drama, George pulled out one of the hardest wins of his career. His next opponent would be Nick Diaz. Known for his scrappy fighting style and brash demeanor, Nick was the polar opposite of George in some ways. However, his boxing and submission skills were undeniable. Nick was known for pressuring opponents in the ring and overwhelming them. His friend and teammate, Jake Shields, shared some of their thoughts going into it. I think the biggest thing was just, you know, try to get a lot of pressure on George, try to really just put some pace on him. A lot of punches make make him get a dumb, a dirty, rough fight, and just try to rough him up a little bit, and, uh, and not stay on bottom for too long. You know, off the takedown, try to get up and, uh, and get George tired. They get George so hard, so hard to submit, so hard, so hard to knock out. But it's not necessarily a weakness, but if, you, if it was to be a weakness, I would say maybe dealing with that pressure fighter, constantly, uh, constantly getting hit. George would go on to win an unanimous decision over Diaz. At this point, he had been the champ for five years and had defended his belt eight times. He'd experienced health problems with ulcerative colitis off and on throughout, but by 2013, it had progressively become worse. His next opponent, Johnny Hendricks, had torn through the division and was in line for the next title shot. George and his camp had suspected that Hendricks was using performance-enhancing drugs, and George later said, that they had forged a gentleman's agreement in which they would both be tested before the fight. However, according to George, Hendricks backed out of it at the last minute. He also shared that he should have pulled out of the fight and that he regrets getting in the cage with Hendricks, but went ahead with it because he didn't want to appear that he was afraid of him. In a fight that was extremely close, George walked away with a split decision victory that was widely considered to be controversial. Following the fight, George announced that he was going to take time off to deal with some personal issues. It was later revealed that his retirement was, in part, due to his ulcerative colitis. George would spend the next four years doing what he loves most. Training, of course. On top of that, he would travel and enjoy the life of a retired world champion. Most importantly, he was able to take care of his health issues to where they could be managed. By 2017, he was ready to come back and test himself again. But this time, he was going to go up and challenge Michael Bisping for the UFC Middleweight Championship. Unbeknownst to him at the time, this would be one of the biggest challenges of his life before he even got in the ring. John Danaher shared that he knew there was something wrong during training. When the Bisping camp was on, George had no idea what was happening to him. All he knew was that he was just couldn't eat, would have to go to the bathroom at times that made no sense, and there was blood everywhere. You know, your, your first thought when you see this thing, I mean, do I have fucking stomach cancer? That's the first thing you're thinking about. And, um, you know, there were, there were genuine concerns, and he had to go to a fight camp with all of this, and he did every kind of testing, and thankfully the uh, the, the worst-case scenarios were quickly removed as, as possibilities. And then it came down to, okay, you've got ulcerative colitis. Now, he was trying to gain weight to go up to 185 pounds, so every time he, he ate, it was torture. You know, his stomach was tearing him up inside. His, he would have to go to the bathroom and, and, uh, and lose the weight he had work so hard to gain and just a disaster. While there were concerns about George's health throughout camp, on the day of the fight, their biggest fears became a reality. And then the very day of the fight, I remember everyone tends to wake up very late on the day of the fight because obviously George doesn't fight until around midnight, so most people wake up pretty uh, pretty late. I remember by my habit tend to wake up rather early and so does Freddie Roach, and Freddie Roach and I were talking. I saw George come out and go to the bathroom and he didn't come out until three hours later. And I went over to him and said, you know, is, is everything okay? And he just looked at me with a stoic look and said, I'm fine. 
feel great. But of course, you know, obviously he wasn't. And uh, then went out and fought one of the greatest fights of his career against a very, very tough and uh, dangerous opponent. And uh, it was only after the fight that he told us the extent of the physical problems he was having. He, he, he kept it to himself through the entire camp. He was worried that if he told us the extent of the problem, that we would lose confidence in his ability to fight. And he didn't want that. Bisping posed a variety of challenges for George. He was bigger, well-rounded, and had great cardio. For George, who was coming off a four-year layoff and in the midst of having serious health issues, these strengths could be a real issue for him. Jason Perillo was also Michael Bisping's longtime trainer, and he shared their strategy for this fight. Just you're moving, you're using, Bisping's got much better footwork, and, and we believe his, his boxing and kickboxing was better than George's. So, you know, just stay on angles and just keep breaking them down and, 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 and let them, you know, just, just, just draw them out to the fight. Just, just stay ahead of them. Joe Rogan said on the broadcast, that George looked better than ever against Michael. After a four-year layoff, many people expected George to look sluggish and rusty. But like we heard earlier, training was a way of life for him, so he never really walked away from the sport. George was used to dominating opponents on the ground, but Bisping posed different problems for him, as Jason explains. When George was able to get the takedown, I thought that's where Michael actually even was most effective, because when Michael was on his back, he was right there for him, and he was dropping elbows, and he split. I mean, George's face was split open. George came walking right up to me. As soon as the fight was over, walked feline straight to me, and, you know, said some very nice things to me, you know, but at the same time, I'm looking at his face. His nose is split open. His head split open. I mean, those were from the elbows he was taking from when he was on his back. George was used to having a size advantage against many of his opponents, but with Bisping, he was actually going against a bigger fighter. I think George was used to being the, the, the much bigger guy when he, when he has a guy underneath him. You know, and all of a sudden he found out he's on a guy that's much bigger than him. Well, he's on top of him and he was, he was taking some damage from it. However, George was able to capitalize on the fact that Bisping couldn't see out of his right eye. You know, George is smart, George did his homework, and George knew that Bisping was blind in that right eye. You know, he knew it, his corners knew it, they all knew it, you know, and that's what a gentleman George is, actually, at the end of the fight. He even, as Joe Rogan's interview, admitted that, you know, and that's what a good, I mean, to me, that's what I like about George. George is an honest motherfucker. He just, like, we knew that Michael had a deficiency or whatever, however he said it, you know, and that's what I take. That's why he was looking for his left hook of his own. He would go on to defeat Bisping with a rear naked choke submission to win the UFC Middleweight Championship. He also won Performance of the Night honors as well. John Danaher described it as one of George's greatest achievements in the sport. You know, there, there was something, nothing less than, than heroic about George's uh, last fight. You know, he just he was just lonely to fight against his own body to uh, to get ready for one of the toughest opponents he went out and faced. And, um, and then to, to win in such a spectacular fashion, it was, it was truly one of his great performances. People always talk about saving the best or last, but um, I think George definitely did that in that fight. This fight helped dispel a couple key criticisms George had faced throughout his career. You know, there were always two big criticisms of George's career. He never went up a weight division to fight, and he was a boring fighter. He was a tactical genius, but a boring fighter to watch. And in his last fight, he disproved both of those criticisms. He went up a weight division, took on the champion, and won. And not only did he win, he won in a thrilling fashion. He finished the fight. Um, now there was drama in the fight. George got cut and uh, uh, had to come back and use the combination of a beautiful left hook followed by very strong grapple boxing on the floor to, to get him a beautiful submission victory. John shared that following the Bisping fight, George was looking at possibly facing Robert Whitaker but his health issues made it impossible for him at the time. George was familiar with Robert, as John explains. I think the original idea was that he would fight uh, Mr. Whitaker. Um, I do know that George had sparred in TriStar Gym with uh, Mr. Whitaker on several occasions and done very well. So he was confident he could do well in, in a mixed martial arts fight with him. But uh, the ulcerative colitis was becoming a real problem. Like we said in the beginning, George lobbied for a fight with UFC lightweight champion Khabib Nurmagomedov a year later, but he shared that the UFC simply wasn't interested. We tried to make that fight. We really tried, and the, the UFC had no interest. And I understand in a way because it's a risk they're not willing to take. If they invest money to promote a fight, and the fruit of their investment, if I win, and the fruit of their investment leave out the door, is gone for another retirement, they lose all, all that, you know. But 
if you look at boxing, or what frustrates me is it's done in boxing all the time. People get the belt, they drop this, they they get they fight. People care about the fight. They don't care about that the damn belt. And that's what frustrated me a little bit about that. I don't care about the belt. I wanted to fight Khabib. I don't care if it was for the belt. So I wanted to do a catch weight or anything because Khabib naturally is maybe bigger than me. He's like, I'm 185. He walks around 190, almost 200 pounds. He's even bigger than me. So I didn't not- care about the belt. Tell you the truth, you know. So I would just care about the fight. He, he was a little bit the same way, but the UFC didn't, didn't want it. They, 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 they didn't want to take that, that risk. George officially retired from mixed martial arts in February of 2019. On May 9th, 2020, at UFC 249, it was announced that George would be inducted into the UFC Hall of Fame's modern wing. Throughout his career, he not only dominated one of the sport's most competitive divisions for the better part of a decade, but he took the sport to new heights in terms of training and professionalism, as Sean Danaher explains. George is one of the first people in mixed martial arts to really elevate the professionalism of the sport. Um, when you look at early mixed martial arts, it was style versus style. It was, you know, crazy kung fu styles versus uh, karate, and then karate versus jiu-jitsu. And, a uh, boxer with one glove that was, was filled with a bunch of movie characters that looked reminiscent of the, the movie Bloodsport. And that was its inception. Then came waves of uh, ground and pound wrestlers who uh, were very successful for a short period of time. And then some kickboxers came in. And over time, you were starting to see the integration of skills. But really, you what you saw typically were people who who were already established in one kind of discipline. They were already a good wrestler. Perhaps they had represented their country or, or their college in wrestling, and then they, they, they learned some mixed martial arts, or they were already representing a team in jiu-jitsu, and then they did mixed martial arts, or they were already an established kickboxer, and then they switched to mixed martial arts. Whereas George started in mixed martial arts. He, you know, he, he didn't have a boxing career before mixed martial arts. He didn't have a jiu-jitsu career before mixed martial arts. Uh, he didn't have a wrestling career before mixed martial arts. He came in first and foremost as a mixed martial artist. In addition, the manner in which he prepared for fights was on a level of professionalism that just hadn't been seen before in the sport. He didn't have someone who just dedicated every waking hour of their day to getting better at, uh, at the sport of mixed martial arts. He was hiring industry professionals in every area of the sport in order to accomplish that. Um, he was dedicating expensive and long fight camps and getting ready for uh, uh, the various fights in which he partook. It was just a, a, a dramatic step up in professionalism and George changed the industry in that regard. He took it from uh, a group of fascinating characters and amateurs and turned it into a professional sport. He was probably the single biggest influence in that regard. Nowadays, George can be found traveling often while still maintaining his training regimen. Carl Massaro shared something about George's training that might seem unique for an athlete of his profile. But even to this day, if George comes to the Hensel Grace Academy, like even today, he still goes in the standard locker room when he doesn't have to. He can go in the instructor's locker room. He can go in the back. Like, he, accept, he expects no special treatment. His fighting career may have come to an end, but that hasn't slowed him down much with his training, as Sandro Furr explains. Till this day, and even if he is retired, he still acts like he's on the roster. So for him, it's a way of life. A lot of people tend to have a lot of discipline, a lot of talent, but I can say what actually makes that difference is You know, he lives by it, so he lives by a code. When we learned of how George still regularly trains with ordinary people and with partners who are well below his skill level, we thought of it as a nice thing to do on his part. And while it's still a good thing, George shared that it's still always about becoming better. People are surprised because they see me in a a regular class on a Saturday afternoon, and I train with regular people. Like, all my training partners are not professional. Like, I train with an accountant, then I'll get a fighter, then I'll get a a blue belt, then I'll get another guy. Like, I I think it's important to have different level of training partner because when you train with guys who are better than you, you, you work on your defense. When you train with guys that are equal as you, you work on your game, you know, to improve all around game and when you work on uh, with guys that are not as good as you you work on your offense so you learn you can learn from everybody and a small big uh, fat guy uh, smart guy dumb guy uh, 
uh, you know, like knucklehead. Uh, you have to change different parts of body type. And that's what makes you better as a fighter because you can adapt better. If you only train with certain guys that are all fight, all the, always the same, you won't be good at adapting yourself. And in fighting, one thing that is very uh, important is to be able to adapt to your opponent and become the perfect nemesis. And how you work on that, these things, it's by training with different training partner, have a different range of guys, you know, so you can adapt, your brain needs to adapt, and become the perfect nemesis, which is in boxing or karate, uh, jiu-jitsu, wrestling, the same thing. You know, you have to do these things, that's part of your homework as a martial artist. George is one of the most dominant world champions in the sport's history. We often see champions flaunting their world titles with pictures of championship belts on social media and giving themselves nicknames like Champ Champ. But for George, it was never about championship belts. It was about the honor of being the champion and the sacrifices it takes to become one. You, you can have good aptitude, good tools, good, you know, good, good athleticism, but you, there is no way you become the best right away. You have to go through all this step and it's very hard. It's a very uh, tough and it, it takes a big hit on your ego mentally. You get broken mentally, physically all the time and you have to put it back together and face adversity again. It's a very tough road. That's why only a few, few people get champion because they have to go through those roads. And uh, one thing I'm proud of is that I did it, you know, and I made it. And, and, and this is one thing I'm very proud of. That's what when you win a belt, that's what the belt means. You know, you went through that road, you know. You won't see pictures of George's championship belts on social media because, well, he doesn't have them. He actually gave nearly all of them away. All the belts that I have, I kept it. I kept one, and all the other belts I gave it to someone that helped me towards that goal, that towards my life, my career, that the different people that have helped me, that had huge impact in my life and incredible importance for me. So every single belt that I won, I gave gave it to one of different people. When I gave it to my mom and my parents, when I gave it to uh, uh, my wrestling coach, when I gave it to Firas, when I gave it to Christophe Nidu, when I, you know, like so many people that I give the belt. Like when I gave it to another guy that helped me back in the day, yeah, he owns a gym. So many people, uh, I give give it to them. Because it, for me, if I keep it for myself in, in a in a lock somewhere, it doesn't have any meaning. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a symbolism of, of a big accomplishment of, of outcoming your fear and and accomplish something that is very hard and you put a lot of work on. So if you can inspire someone, so if, if someone, if I give it to someone and someone can put it on a wall somewhere and, and there's a, like maybe a kid that, that walked by and he said, oh, that's George St. Pierre's belt. Oh, wow, I want to have one one day. If, if it, it can inspire him, this this is the reason why I'm doing this. You know, if I keep it for myself, like, and, and it has no meaning somewhere in my house. I, it, it, it's a belt. It, it's, it's a trophy. It's made to show. It's made to shine. It's made to put in a museum someone. Actually, the Nad, Canadian History uh, Museum has one in Ottawa. So, you know, it, it has to, to be there to show. It's a symbol of, of accomplishment. And, and that's why, for me, personally, it doesn't have any value to me. But it's a symbolism. So it, it, it could inspire people. So that's why I'm doing this. At one point, he actually ran out of belts to give away. At one point, they stopped. They changed the rules. They stopped. They stopped giving me the belt. Can you believe it? We run out of belts. I should run out of belts for you. I, they run out of the fucking belt. And, and, and I should have done like McGregor did. If I would have go back in time, one thing that I'm not so proud of, I should have said is, like, where, am I, where are my belts at? Where is my belts at? And I would have <laughs> kept all my belts. And, and, and I would have been able to give more to people to, that, that have helped me through, through my journey. But unfortunately, because it was the first time it was done, I was like, okay, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, you, you, they say, okay, keep the same belt and bring it back every time. I'm like, you know, like the Stanley Cup in hockey and all that, you know. So it was kind of sad, but I, you know, it is what it is. I think I have like five belts or six, like maybe I think five belts, but I won like 10 in total, 10 or 11 in total because it's plus Michael Bisping. So I think it's 10. So I have like five, like one for myself and then... Like I think it's four, four or five are two different people, you know. My mom, uh, Fedas, Tristar. One is um, my wrestling coach. One is uh, the the Natural History Museum. One is another friend of mine that that helped me back in the day. And 
Yeah, I think that's four actually. They, they only gave me five on the uh, five out of the ten, you know. But yeah, it, it was the like five. I think. It, yeah, but I had, I had one in the beginning. Then I lost it to Ferro. Then I I gained. I think it was eight or nine, eight consecutive. Then after I had one more after for this thing. So I think it's. I'm not even sure, but I lost count. But 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 like I don't have all the belts because they they, they didn't give it to me all. You know. One of George's belts can be found at the Canadian Museum of History in Quebec, and the story of how it got there is actually quite interesting. One of my belts have been stolen one time and has been put on eBay, can you believe it? And then it has been bought by the Canadian History Museum, <laughs> and that's how they got it, you know? So so for me, it's it's a belt, you know what I mean? It's a, it's a trophy. It's a nice thing, but it's made to, to show, to shine, you know? George was generous with his teammates and coaches in other ways as well, as Sandro Fur shares. I remember a day when I think it was after the BJ Penn fight, he had came to the gym with uh, a huge box and he came into the TriStar gym like right on me before sparring and he turned over the box and like he threw on the mat sweatsuits, running shoes, t-shirts, bandanas, caps, uh, tubes. You name it, gloves, shin pads, like I remember. And in the day, if I recall right, like the sponsor was full contact fighter and uh, he came to his gym and like he threw a huge box like on top of the mat and he goes, go ahead guys, like this is all yours, like you earned this, you know. It was a lot of gratitude, you know, like he didn't have to do that. So he actually came to the gym and he really thought of us. There's a lot of people that tend to become famous, like they tend to become very selfish. But George actually wasn't. Like he always remembered from where he's from. And uh, even to this day, I find that George is still a martial artist. So I guess that's what makes him different. So I guess those were his Kyrgyzstan roots, which was integrity, a lot of respect. One of George's greatest personal accomplishments was something that happened outside the sport. Kenny Florian shared a story about a conversation he and George once had, where George talked about one of the things he was most proud of. You know, um, you, you've accomplished everything, you know, in, in the sport. And he's like, well, no, n not only in the sport. He goes, I, I've really accomplished what I wanted to do. And I said, well, what do you mean? And he said, well, a, a couple months ago a after I had won, um, I, I forget which fight it was. Uh, he had said, you know, I, I was going to take a, a, a trip, you know, to Brazil to go train after one of my fights. And before I did that, I went to I went to a bank. I found out, um, you know, what my parents, you know, mortgage information was and all that stuff. And I had paid off their house completely. And I paid off all of their debts. I paid off everything, their cars, their houses. And I took off without saying anything. And he, you know, my mom had called me, you know, eventually she got a hold of me. And she was crying and she was, you know, just... She couldn't believe that I had done that. And she goes, and he said that there was, that was probably the most proud moment in his life, you know, the happiest he'd ever felt. And he felt like he always, he'd always wanted to do that for his parents. And, you know, the fact that he was finally able to do that, um, you know, he felt like he had accomplished everything he'd wanted, wanted to do. And, and I just, I thought that was such a, I had never heard that story. No one ever t told me that story to this day. I don't think George has ever mentioned that publicly, but to me, it just, really showed what kind of a person he is and I just thought that was that was really special. George St. Pierre demonstrated time and again that he's not only one of the greatest fighters of all time but he's also one of the great ambassadors of the sport. In closing we are going to leave you with one last clip from one of George's first jiu-jitsu teachers his good friend Sean Williams who sums up George's mentality as both a martial artist and a world champion. That guy is, a, is literally a martial artist inside and out. It doesn't matter if he has a fight coming up. It doesn't matter what he's training all the time. If it, if it was a night out, uh, we had a night out, guess what? No one was off training. We were all training. He would press you to train and he would do his training. It's, it's just, yeah, his, his work ethic. I think that's super important when you're talking about uh, championship quality that, that, because that's a quality that you, you either have it or you don't. You don't get taught that, you know? And then when you have it, and you're lucky enough to find an avenue to, to use it, and you're good at that avenue, it boils down even more, well, then 
you get him, the best ever. Like what you just heard? Check us out on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at MMA True Fan. Merchandise can be found on our website at MMATrueFan.com. Join us on Patreon for exclusive bonuses. Please subscribe, rate, and review on Apple Podcasts, YouTube, or wherever you're listening. Special thanks to George St. Pierre, Bob Cook, Monty Cox, John Danaher, Sandro Fur, Kenny Florian, Penzo Gracie, Jeremy Horn, Greg Jackson, Carl Massaro, Pat Militich, Phil Nurse, Jason Perillo, Caro Parisian, Matt Serra, Sean Shirk, Pete Spratt, Jake Shields, Frank Trigg, and Sean Williams. Created and written by Nate Evans. Narrated by Rich Donahue and Ashley Evans. Edited by Rich Donahue and Nate Evans. Music by With Lions Productions. Artwork by Mike Zant.